Hi everyone, it's Paul Tilly and welcome back to EC1210 Macroeconomics. Today we're looking at Unit 6, Fiscal Policy. You'll find all of the information with regards to fiscal policy in Unit 6 of the D2L and Chapter 7 of the textbook. Specifically, we're going to be looking at describing how the federal government's budget depends on three factors, the rate of taxation, the size of the gross domestic product, and its own spending levels. We're going to explain the pros and cons of budget policy aimed at achieving full employment equilibrium. We're going to explain the pros and cons of budget policy aimed at achieving balanced budget in fiscal year. We're going to explain the pros and cons of budget policy aimed at achieving both full employment and balanced budget over the life of the budget, uh, over the life of the business cycle. We're going to explain the pros and cons of budget policy aimed at achieving both full employment and a balanced budget over the life of the business cycle. And we're going to discuss the cause, size, and problems of the national debt. First, let's take a look at fiscal policy in general and how the budget relates to that. Governments have to spend. And you think about it, you know, a country or a province or a town, they all come together with the intention of working together to achieve some goals. That's exactly what government does. In order to achieve those goals, it usually involves spending. So obviously there has to be some revenue in order to allow for that spending. You either get revenues or you borrow money. So government, every year, they make a plan. And this plan is called the budget. And the budget effectively lays out the spending priorities for a government. And different political stripes will have different priorities. When we have elections, you will see priorities change. But the fact is, is that every single government, no matter what political stripe, will create a budget that lays out their spending objectives and also spells out how they're going to get revenue. Where's the revenue going to come from? Taxpayers or you're going to borrow it. So what should a government's attitude be towards its own spending and taxation? It really depends on the political stripe. How small or large should government spending be? How large or small should taxation be? Should the two be equal? Should we spend as much as we tax? In other words, do revenues and expenditures meet one another, or is there borrowing in place? Does the condition of the economy have anything to do with the answers to these questions? It certainly does. It's going to affect how much tax revenue is generated. If the economy is doing real well, there's lots of tax money coming in. If the economy is not doing so well, there's less tax money coming in. These are the types of problems or issues that are addressed by government and spoken about in the budget. The budget is presented every single year. This, for example, right here, I have a video of the Minister of Finance, in this case is Christopher Freeland, 2022, as really a tangible example that where government gets to announce its spending priorities and how it's going to pay for those, either through borrowing or through taxation. In terms of what we have with fiscal policy, fiscal policy is really the power of the federal government to tax. And they have to draw in money from various sources, corporations, individuals, in order to pay for all of the projects and programs that they want to provide. People have many different perspectives on how best to manage the economy. You know, if, for example, the economy is in poor shape, jobs are not plentiful, governments can spend more money and that will help create jobs. But on the other hand, governments could also say, we don't want to increase our debt or deficit. We would prefer that we just kind of cut spending altogether. The government is a very large portion of the economy. So government's decisions are going to affect how well the economy performs. So the federal government changes the total amount or the composition of the revenues and expenditures in order to manage the growth and the demand in the economy. So say, for example, if the economy is doing really well, government can reduce its spending at that time, and that would actually reduce the total amount of spending overall, because as I say, government makes up a big chunk of spending in, in, in our economy, and government can actually slow down the economy and lower inflation. The objective, really, of any government is to keep a growing labor force in the country's stock of industrial plants and machinery employed at relatively high levels without having it go so hot that we generate inflation. That's always a problem. If you got too many jobs and too many dollars chasing too few goods, and you're going to be looking at prices going up, and government doesn't want that either. So government has to do this dance, this balancing act between creating the right amount of incentive to keep the economy buzzing along at a good rate, but not such a high rate 
that it drives up inflation and prices. So in good economic times, people are employed and there are more income money available to spend. So increases in government revenue, such as taxes, reduce aggregate demand. Obviously, you're pulling money out of the economy when you tax people. They don't have as much money to spend. Higher expenditures by government increase aggregate demand. Obviously, government spends lots of money. You're going to have lots of demand going up there. It's going to create jobs and create a demand in the economy. Thus, if private spending, such as purchases of cars by consumers, falls, so let's assume that we're into a situation where people aren't buying as much stuff, governments can seek to prevent problems by increasing its own demand, okay? So government kind of kind of step in and increase demand, which artificially brings up, or realistically, brings up the demand and brings the economy back to life. Such was the case that happened in COVID. We saw a very tangible example. You know, when COVID struck, the economy basically slowed down overnight. What did government do? Government stepped in and, and brought out all of the funding programs that would help people, first of all, who were affected by COVID, those who were laid off, received a CERB benefit, that kept money flowing into the economy. Government started buying things. Government started pushing money out. And this helped keep the economy going, despite the fact that the things were really slowed down thanks to COVID. So in those type of environments, yes, spending is really good because it keeps people from not having any money. Now, the problem with that is, is someone got to pay for that. And that's ultimately what's happening now. We're seeing that the bills for CERB are coming in right now. And the, the government is saying, okay, we have to reduce our spending somehow or another. So as we move into a new year and new budgets, we're going to see budget probably reduce spending to reflect the fact that, you know, people are coming back to work now. There's more money floating around and we don't need government injecting as much. And government really has to pay off its debts. If we look at some interesting stats here on the government influence, okay, government influence on spending. The federal government and provincial government and municipal government all buy things, okay? And what percentages of GDP does it really make up, which is the spending component, the G spending component there? Income security, 11% of GDP is government. Education and health, 15%. Housing and culture and recreation, 1.5%. Public safety, 2%. And national defense is 1.2% of GDP. So you can see that government is a big influencer. If you look at the United States, you see government is not nearly involved except when it comes to defense. Defense is always much higher. And we hear in the news, for example, the United States would like Canada to put about 2% of its GDP into defense. Canada's reluctant to do that. We're going to see some changes in that in the next couple of years. But, you know, that, that's big spending. And, and if we don't, if we, if we spend money on defense, we're not going to spend it somewhere else. That's the real trick with this. I have here an example of the 2019 budget. And here's a very succinct example that you will find in your textbook. This is obviously slimmed down. But you can see revenues and expenses reflected there from the budget. And we've brought them down into a, some summary categories, okay? Personal income taxes, revenue to government was $164 billion. Uh, corporate and other income taxes, $50.4 billion. EI premiums, people paying money, you know, comes after your check, that's $22 billion. GST, excise, and energy taxes, 57. Uh, Non-tax revenues, 38. So total revenues for government would have been $332 billion. Then we look at the expenditure side. And the expenditure side is transfers to persons. That's, you know, unemployment insurance and the like, or employment insurance and the like, $96 billion. Special spending grants, Jordan loves the government, $76 billion. Public debt charges, paying the interest on our debt, basically. Um, $23 billion, direct program spending, $151 billion, for total expenses of $346.2 billion. So you'll notice that the expenses exceeded our revenues. All that means is that some of the spending was funded by borrowing. In other words, we're going to make our grandchildren pay for it. And in this case, the budget deficit, or the difference between how much was taken in and how much was spent, was $14 billion. So we spent more than we took in. 
So you can see the distribution of revenues and expenses here broken down in these pie charts. You can see that a good chunk of the revenues from government comes from people. Personal income tax represents about half of all revenues that come in and the other bits you can see there. In terms of expenditures, obviously direct program expenditures, actual government spending for their programs, about 43%. Transfers to persons are about another 30%. So let's put some numbers around fiscal policy. First, let's look at this concept of net tax revenue. Net tax revenue is all of the tax money that comes into government less the amounts that government in turn sends back to people in the form of transfer payments, such as payments for employment insurance or GST or these sorts of things. So effectively, net tax revenue is what government has left after it's paid all its transfer payments. And that amount of money is the amount of money government has to work with in order to provide programs and services. Now, if government uses that amount of money to buy programs and services and doesn't spend any more, we have what's called a balanced budget, meaning the amount of money coming in matches the amount of money going out. The reality is that that doesn't always happen. Sometimes government collects more than it spends, but more often than not, government spends more than it collects. So we don't necessarily have a balanced budget. Government's job then is to be able to write that with regards to it. How can we get as close to balance as possible while at the same time achieving our desired results in terms of managing the economy? And that's what government has to do. That's the line that government walks. So ideally, you could imagine from an economics point of view, we would like the balanced budget approach to be the primary approach that government uses. That is, the amount of money coming in is equal to the amount of money going out. The reality is, though, that don't always happen. Sometimes, government has a situation in which there's more money coming in than going out. Now, you ask, well, when would that happen? Well, if the economy's doing really well, and let's assume there's more jobs than enough, uh, everyone's working, do the government really need to spend a lot in those environments? No, it doesn't. If everyone's working, there's a lot of tax money coming in. You can imagine that taxes will go up. So as a result, government will have a lot of money coming in and doesn't need to spend a lot. This is what's called a budget surplus. And the idea behind budget surplus, or the goal of budget surplus times, is to take the extra money and pay it down on the debt, which is the total sum of all of the deficits from years past. All of the money that's owing, that government has owing, it will pay some of that down. Well, every once in a while, we have a budget surplus, and government then in turn takes that money and pays down the debt. More often than not, though, government is in a situation where it's running a deficit, meaning that it is spending more money every year than it has coming in. That could be negative from an economics point of view. You know, we're spending more than we're taking in. But it might also be necessary if the economy is in turmoil, for example, a lot of people are laid off, it's always a good idea for government to spend in those times in order to get people back to work. And that's what government tries to do. So this is the, the political impetus versus the economic impetus. Often governments get chewed up for running a deficit, particularly if it runs a deficit year after year after year, and that builds up what's called the national debt. And when we think of the national debt, it is really the sum of all of the deficits. So government really has to work hard to manage the national debt so that it doesn't get so large that it impedes our ability to spend money when we need to spend money and impedes our ability to get money when we need to get money. You can see here in the, the various graphics that over the course of years, this is from 79 to about 2020, you can see that, yeah, oftentimes we are running a deficit but sometimes we are running a surplus. The ones above the line are surplus, the ones below the line are deficit. The summary of all of the debts add up. You can see now getting up towards 2020 that we have almost $700 billion in national debt. Now we ask ourselves, how relevant is this? Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of money to have to pay back, but on the other hand, relative to our GDP and relative to the economy, it's probably not a huge amount of money in terms of the big picture. So government really needs to consider all of these points whenever it develops a budget. It needs to think about, you know, what impact does it have on the gross domestic product of the country? Uh, what is the desired impact? Is it to get people back to work in, in low times? Is it to, to be able to 
gather up a lot of tax money in really good times and not spend too much. We got to consider what tax rate that government should charge in terms of the percentage of income that gets collected back in taxes. Government can increase taxes effectively by by changing the tax rate higher, and that will draw more money in and slow down the economy, but also allow us to pay down our debt. Or government can consider changing its spending. It can reduce spending in good times. That is the, the assumption. And when it reduces spending, that way it will not incur these major deficits. There's a bunch of schools of thought with regards to what government should do. And there's really three broad categories of thought. We have something called a counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Now, we've already talked about Keynesian economics, and this is really coming out of Keynesian economics. And it just says, look, government needs to spend in bad times to keep the economy going. The other philosophy that's on a very right, more right-wing point of view is to say, look, we're going to balance the budget regardless of anything. So some governments have even brought in laws that say we had to have a balanced budget. Although it sounds good on the days when, when it's brought forth, you know, people say, well, that's good. The government can't run a deficit. I like that. Our taxes won't go up. Well, how about in bad times then? What does government do in bad times if it ties its hands by creating a policy that says it can't run a deficit? So what we end up with is usually some combination of these two. Most governments will come up with what's called a cyclical balanced budget policy, which basically said, look, in bad times, we're allowed to run a deficit. Let's allow ourselves to do that. In good times, we don't want to run a deficit. We want to be able to pay down our debt at that point in time. And, and usually governments, you will hear governments tout this third option as the preferred option most of the time. 